All right, what's up, good people? The title of this one is How American Indians Became Negro, White, Black, or More, Colored, African, Mulatto, African American. It's a lot to go into it. And it's actually, the Black or More part ain't nothing new. And Negro. The other things, it just threw into the mix. But. We'll break them all down. We're going to start with Jack D. Forbes. See what he's talking about. The use of the terms Negro and Black to include persons of Native American ancestry in Anglo North America. We can call that American Indian. In 1854, the California State Supreme Court sought to bar all non-Caucasians from equal citizenship and civil rights. The court stated the word black may be include may include all Negroes, but the term Negro does not include all black persons. We are of the opinion that the words white, Negro, mulatto and black person, whenever they occur in our Constitution, must be taken in their generic sense. That the words black person in the 14th section must be taken as contra distinguished from white and necessarily includes all races other than Caucasian. A lot of technology. So they didn't want to have all those different nationalities. They just wanted you to be either one or the other. As convoluted as the quote may be, it tends to express a strong tendency in the history of the United States toward creating two broad classes of people, white and non-white, citizen and non-citizen, or semi-citizen. That semi-citizen is state citizen. And that's the one they didn't want on the federal level until the 14th Amendment. All right, the tendency to create a two caste society often clashed with the reality of a territory which included many different types of people of all colors and different degrees of intermixture of European, American, African, and Asian. Native American people, whether of mix, unmixed ancestry or mixed with other stocks, were at times affected by the tendency to create a purely white, black social system, especially when living away from a reservation or the ancestral homeland. In the British slave colonies of North America, along the Atlantic coast, many persons of American ancestry were at times classified as blacks, Negroes, mulattoes, or people of color. And these terms were, of course, used for people of African ancestry. The manner in which Americans and part Americans were sometimes classified as mulattoes and people of color from New England to South Carolina and in the Spanish Empire are explored elsewhere. The purpose here is to illustrate how the term Negro has been applied to people of American descent. Now that's that's pretty in depth. I don't even think there's no need to even try to go no further than that. We'll break down some more. The possibility that Native Americans were quite commonly called Negroes is very much supported by Portuguese usage. During the colonial period, Brazilian Indians were repeatedly referred to as Negroes or as Negroes de Terra, Negroes of the land, quote unquote. A great many examples from the 16th and later centuries are cited by George Frederici in his analysis of Portuguese sources. These do not have to be repeated here, but suffice to say that it was so common that finally in 1755, a royal decree had to be issued as follows. Among the regrettable practices which have resulted in the disparagement of the Indians, one prime abuse is the unjustifiable and scandalous practice of calling them Negroes. Perhaps by doing so, the intent was no other than to induce in them the benefit that they, that by their origins they had been destined to be slaves of whites. 
as in generally conceded to be the case of blacks from the coast of Africa. The directors will not permit his for henceforth that anybody may refer to an Indian as a Negro, nor that they themselves may use this epithet among themselves as is currently the case. Wow. This Portuguese usage, usage is extremely significant, not only because American or part American slaves could be referred to as Negroes in early shipment records, but also because it very much affects one's analysis of population statistics in colonial Brazil, where in fact the categories of Negro and mulatto must have often included domesticated or enslaved Indians and mixed bloods. Well, we ain't got to know African part yet, but I guess it's somewhere in there, huh? Insofar as the term Negro became synonymous with slave or a servile status, it lost any specific color reference and became a general term of abuse. Darker people were preferring to be called Preto as a result. It is highly likely that the Spaniards also referred to slaves generally as Negroes in the Caribbean and that the Dutch took over the same general practice. Since Negro and Neger were not Dutch words and had no immediate equivalent except Swart, Donker and Bruin, a Dutch French Spanish dictionary of 1639 has the following entry for Spanish Negro, Noir, Sombre, Obscure, Affusque, Bruin, which is French, Swart, Donker, Bruin, Dutch. The Spanish Negro could be translated as dark or brown as well as black Swart. Undoubtedly, this usage facilitated making reference to all slaves as Negroes or Negers in the Dutch language. Moreover, it is significant that a Spaniard residing in Antwerp in the early 16th century saw Negro as being translated in a number of ways in both French and Dutch. By the later half of the 16th century, the English were referring to the people of Africa as Ethiopians, Blackamoors, Negroes, and more somewhat interchangeably. Negro gradually came to be the dominant term, especially after exhausted contact with the Spanish and Portuguese. What is not clear is the extent to which the term Negro was consciously translated as black. The automatic associated association of Negro with black color cannot be assumed since may, since may black Africans are actually of medium or dark brown color. In any case, another association gradually arose and that was between Negro and slave. Early legislation commonly referred to Negro and other slaves or to Negro, mulatto and Indian slaves. Over the years, Negro and black both became synonymous, synonymous with enslavement. In 1702, an observer wrote that the wealth of Virginia consisted of slaves or Negroes. By 1806, Virginia judges ruled that a person who was of a white appearance was presumed to be free, but in the case of a person visibly appearing to be of the slave race, it is incumbent upon him to make out his freedom. In 1819, South Carolina judges stated flatly, the word Negroes has a fixed meaning, slaves. What the English meant by the term Negro when they first began to use it is not clear. Certainly it was not then synonymous, synonymous with slave. And as a great many persons so classified were free, both in England and in Virginia, did it mean an African, a black person, or any dark-skinned individual? Today the term is not widely employed in Britain. Although the word black is used to refer to people of various skin colors from all of South Asia, the Middle East, the West Indies, and Africa. Most Native Americans, if living in Britain today, would be referred, regarded as being black, especially if their ancestry were not known. Negro was also used in a general way in the North American colonies. Some examples illustrate the use of Negro and black as applied to people of American ancestry. Hmm. The thing I find strange is, so we know we got Indian slavery, those are dark-skinned people, but then you got a free population 
of dark skinned people. So we know how that's going. We know they fighting over land and resources. But then they come back around to so who are all these pale skinned people? We kind of pretty much know they getting locked up to and enslaved. But we're gonna get it in though. An example from the West Indies is especially illuminating. In 1764, William Young was sent to St. Vincent as a part of the British occupation of that land. Living on St. Vincent were about 3,000 black cherubs or caribs or free Negroes. And their slaves, according to Young, the British found it difficult to control the caribs and wars were fought with them in 1771 72 and again during 1795 96 during the latter crisis young wrote an extremely anti-carib tract designed to prove that the caribs should be removed from saint vincent they were eventually defeated and some 5,000 were shipped to an island near the coast of honduras young was anxious to prove that the so-called black caribs were not true aborigines but were in fact negro colonists who negro colonists I like them black Europeans. That's who that is. So you got the black. You got black on black. So who are these white people? Because I know white is a status. And I know a lot of people got shipped out of Europe that they didn't need. So it's a whole lot of whole lot of swirling, as they say. Whole lot of miscegenation going on. Negro colonists. Young was anxious to prove that the so-called black Caribs were not true aborigines, but were in fact Negro colonists, free Negroes or Negro usurpers. This was important to him because he wanted to show they had no bona fide land rights or aboriginal title. The same thing going on today, except we don't own that and we just fighting, fighting and killing over nothing. Pair of shoes don't mean nothing. Well, I don't think people kill those shoes no more, do they? Mm. People just be fighting now. They just pop off. Mm. That's wild, though. So we know what's going on. It's that black on black crime. It's them black Europeans. Well, actually, they white in status when they get in America, but they still dark nonetheless, though. So the white status, that's why I put that in the title. Like, white just a status. It ain't got nothing to do with no skin color. That wasn't associated with a skin color until 1900. What it is. 1895, 1900. When they started basically bleaching themselves out and putting their mulatto kids on the forefront. Because what they do, they want people to keep thinking about this African stuff. Man, you got shipped over here and all this. No. None of that happened. Probably happened a little bit. They say like what, two hundred and eighty-eight thousand? Yeah, you can round it off three hundred thousand. That still don't produce the forty-one million people plus the fourteen million acres that that these so-called black Africans and just got out of slavery people had in nineteen hundred. You got fourteen. What do they say? Between fourteen and twenty twenty million acres or something. If people been holding on to that land because it wasn't about no skin color, it was about status. What I believe is passing for free or white, as they call it, I think it really depends on what kind of clothes you had on. I know when I was in school, you got to have on, you got to be dressed pretty decent, but if you don't, but I'm talking about even the kids out the project get the job on you, and they mama don't pay nothing but $17 rent, and they'll clown you. Boy, my folk got a house, boy. We paying rent and we got car payments, all kind of stuff. Well, I got to get whatever I can get. So I think that's pretty much what free is. But being free wasn't even hard. You just get up and walk away. Like Eddie Griffin say, you want to be free? It's just state of mind. Get up, walk off. They're going to do something, fight about it. But here we go. For our purposes, the interesting point omitted by Young is that the so-called blacks or Negroes were occasionally of tawny and mixed complexion. How 
are they tiny and mixed so they getting lighter or is europeans mixing with the american indians still dark skin but they know they from two different places so they're gonna call them mixed and mulatto because of american ancestry and that their customs personal names and language were those of the native caribs still further young admitted that they had repeatedly intermarried with american women he consistently refers to them as negroes nonetheless if you ever get a map and look at it you actually see that like africa asia europe all of that is connected so you can, you really can't even look at africa as considered africa it's actually part of europe so it can go either way so these, these folks can say they african like people, a lot of people in africa talk british so are they really african they could be europeans that happen to you know just migrate down there and been down there a couple hundred years you know they probably got that secret handshake going on and they just like you know bloody mate yeah i'm from africa man but they talk better than the people who live in all up in england and yeah, the people in england starting to talk like they from america i be listening to their music hey it, it, it sounds good so them, them, uh, them, them, them black European, they be saying nigga way more than I, I done said it in my lifetime. They be getting it in. But it is what it is. Young also relayed a great deal of hearsay information about how the black Caribs had originated, which is without foundation for analysis here. The important point is this, that a people thoroughly American in identity, culture, and language were called black. And black was fighting words for my mom and dad of them because I think they was on the Negro status. Because that was like what her grandma time when they start when they what Negroes just been around anyway. They know they Indian, but you know what I'm saying? Negro part, you know, you got all these foreigners around or the people you grew up around here. Y'all know y'all. Y'all know your, your peoples. But that's how it is in the South. Hell, yeah. we done went to school together. We know you. You might be some kin to me. So what it do? What's up? All right. Yeah. The important point is this, that a people thoroughly American in identity, culture, and language were called black and Negro solely because of being mixed with African ancestry. I don't believe in that African ancestry because you got black Europeans over here fighting with american indians and they look just the same the only people who don't look alike is pale skin people and i'm gonna jump to something else real quick matter of fact dang do i got my let's see if i got my little part about who the burbers are well we'll keep it moving well i gotta break that down that south carolina passage and so matter of fact I'm going to do a quick Google search, too, just to put it on there. And so it get complicated when I get the flow on, though. Where was I? This tendency continues, incidentally, among white scholars who even today refuse to accept the Caribs' avowed feelings of Indianness and continue to call them black. In 1619, some 20 Negroes were brought to Virginia. At least 11 have names of Spanish or probably Spanish character. Later, they were joined by Negroes and mulattoes with names such as Antonio and John Pedro. These Spanish-derived servants could well have been part of American ancestry. However, no evidence is available except that they were largely secured from captured Spanish vessels. Oh, my goodness. I got the thing on there that say what was really going on matter of fact okay now i can pull that up to make myself happy and here we go Dang, I gotta work on it. It's so lit. 
I gotta find the one with Queen Elizabeth. Oh, it's on here. Hold on. Let me see what she had. Black. The Bartels. Here we go. Too many Blackamoors, deportation, discrimination, and Elizabeth the first. Now, in 1596, Queen Elizabeth issued an open letter to the Lord Mayor of London announcing that there are of late divers blackamoors brought into this realm of which kind of people there are already here too many and ordering that they be deported from the country one week later she reiterated her good pleasure to have those kind of people sent out of the land and commissioned the merchant casper van sendern sending to take up certain blackamoors here in the realm and to transport them into spain and portugal why she sending them to spain and portugal because they were the first ones because this is what um what 10 years before the english even came because sir francis drake and them was they were pirating they didn't come on land anything spain and portugal picked up they was intercepting so this is how we're gonna get this this black and more flow coming in finally in 1601 she complained again about the great number of nigars which means king which is wild shout out to spice one I caught that on the video. That was smooth. He was on Vlad, matter of fact. You tell him, nigga, me, king, niggars, all that, man. Get right. We know what it is. It's just in us, man. It's in the spirit, man. We just be, oh, man, I'm enjoying it. Shout out to the white people that rock with us, too. There's a lot of it's a lot of mixed people around here. Yes, a lot of mixed people. They real cool too. They can go either way with it. They might call you a nigga R and be like, you be like, what? You look too light, but I, right. you about poor as I am, so shit. You can say it all you want. <laughs> all right, great numbers of niggars and blackamoors, which, as she is informed, are crept into this realm, defamed them as infidels having no understanding of christ or his gospel and one last time authorized their deportation now to say that these people have no understanding of christ or his gospel now the main thing people always say about africa quote unquote is that christianity came from there so you know you can't be no african people because they always tell you man ethiopia got they invented Christianity and everything else. So, hey, that eliminates a whole yeah, a whole lot of territory. All right. Let's get to the next page. We're going to get it. And it wasn't race-based. It wasn't a race-based culture barrier of a sort England had not seen since the expulsion of the Jews at the end of the 13th century. Ooh. And justifying the geographical alienation of certain Negars and Blackamoors, the Queen sets them categorically apart from her own liege people. How you set them apart from your people? We, we this is black people that live in England. So you like them ain't them, them ain't them niggas, you know. Them, them niggas, them blackamoors and stuff. Now, my people are just regular dark skinned English people. Because, I mean, if it's a whole lot of white people, I mean, they can't, you can't blend in. You can't be that, that drop of coffee in a bowl of milk and think you're going to blend in. The queen sets them cat categorically apart from her own liege people. While she figures the English in terms of their natural national allegiance, she designates the Negars and Blackamoors as a kind of people. Those kind defined by skin color, the blackness stressed by Negars and Blackamoors and associated less inclusively with religion or lack of religion. Most are infidels. That is against the contrasting national identity of her subjects. She depicts and condemns Negars and Blackamoors generally as a race, a black race. Queen Elizabeth was bleaching her skin. So she was a Negar too, but whatever. Whatever. These documents have become pivotal to 
critical assessments of the material and ideological place of blacks within England, as well as of early construction, constructions of racism and race within English literature of the period. Critics have read Elizabeth's letters as the visible, visible signature of the imperial metropolis, nervous writing out of its marginalized other, and have taken the writing out of blacks as the writing in a in of a derogatory associated association of blackness and race. <sighs> They're gonna try to make it seem like it's a race based thing. But come on, man. Come on, man. But this is what it is. In fact, although in Elizabeth presents the presence of Blackamoors in England as a local and internal problem prompted by the fact that of late divers Blackamoors have been brought into this realm and added to a population that already numbers to many. Her efforts are framed by a much larger, long-standing conflict, England's ongoing war with Spain. That conflict, which had been heightened more than mollified by the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, was playing itself out partly in privateering ventures of the sort that were bringing Blackamoors into England. Whatever the ideological bearings, Elizabeth's plan to reverse that immigration emerge as a practical solution to her need to reclaim English prisoners from Spain. From what we can tell, in each case, the queen intended to exchange Blackamoors for the captive English. From the start, then, the Nigars and Blackamoors selected for deportation were caught not simply in a binary position, opposition with England's own liege people, but also in a triangulation with the Spanish, a triangulation defined by the practicalities of war and, in many cases, inattentive to boundaries of race or color. As Elizabeth's letters map out these transactions, they do show us a color-based racist discourse in the making, but significantly it is a discourse shaped, complicated, and comprised by political and economic circumstances. Yeah. It goes into a whole lot of stuff, whole lot of stuff. And this around the same time, they got to start a system to keep their people from dying and starving and stuff before they start shipping them off. Because a lot of people didn't work, didn't do anything. They just hung around loitering like the stuff we used to get tickets for, jaywalking and stuff, anything. To date, Critics have only speculated about the identity of these subjects, first called Blackamoors, and in the last letter, Nigars and Blackamoors, and in efforts to underscore the racial politics significantly at issue here, have named them Black servants, Moors, and Africans. As Nabil Matar has cautioned, these terms are not interchangeable, and while their use was indispensable in articulating race as a visual category for early modern as well as modern readers, we are now in a position to historicize these markers more carefully and to recognize their vagueness and intermittency. In the 17th century, Blackamore gets someone codified in poetry, all that crazy stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. What we got to get to. What gets notably and I would argue strategically lost in these inscriptions is the fact that the initial group targeted for deportation were Negroes captured from a Spanish colony in the West Indies. Specifically, in 1596, the Queen proposes deporting 10 Blackamoors who had been recently brought into the country by Thomas Baskerville. Wow. She explains to the Lord Mayor her majestic understanding that there are of late divers Blackamoors brought into this realm of which kind of people there are already here too many. So they already had a shit ton of people from America in there. Or, my bad, they had a, a, too many people in England anyway to deal with for them to bring more. Considering how God had blessed this land with great increase of people, 
of our own nation as any country in the world whereof many for want of service and means to set them on work fall to idleness and to great extremity her majesty's pleasure therefore is that is that those kind of people should be sent forth of the land and for that purpose there is direction given to this bearer, bearer Edward Baines, to take of those blackamoors that in this last voyage under Sir Thomas Baskerville were brought into this realm, the number of ten, to be transported by him out of the realm, wherein we require, require you to be, well, they couldn't write in England. I mean, they don't write like we write. That's that old English. Be against and assisting unto him as he shall have occasion and thereof not to fail wow the voyage elizabeth references the last voyage of baskerville of 1595 through 96 was commanded by john hawkins and francis drake both hawkins and drake died during the expedition and baskerville who had been commissioned as colonel general of the land troops ended up in charge the venture was designed to recharge england's waning efforts against the spanish drake and hawkins proposed sending ships to the isthmus of panama where the panama canal at to intercept intercept the silver spain was bringing from peru and so to cripple the spanish economically and militarily Elizabeth, however, was troubled by rumors that the Spanish were advancing on England and insisted on a project close to home. As a compromise, she agreed to a raid on a Spanish ship grounded in San Juan de Puerto Rico and loaded with tow millions and, ha and a half of tre ooh, treasure. The mission in San Juan fell, however, and Hawkins died. Hence, Drake turned to what early maps depicted as the West Indies. West Indian mainland and waged an assault on the town of Rio de la Haca, a pearl fishing settlement consisting of about 50 houses occupied by the Spanish. According to a key account in Richard Hakluts, the principal navigators, voyages, traffics, and discoveries of the English nation, the Spanish governor Manso de, de Contreras tried to negotiate a ransom for the town, but apparently not to Drake's liking. So they was over there hitting lit. They were pulling kick doughs. That's crazy. As a result, while Baskerville stormed an outpost, the general Drake with some 150 men took the Rancheria, a fisher town where they dragged for Pearl. The people all fled except some 16 or 20 soldiers, which fought a little, but some were taken prisoners besides many Negroes with some store of pearls and other pillage and uh, and another negotiation of ransom fell and after the spanish cleared out at drake's command the ranchera and the town of rio de la haca were burnt completely down to the ground the churches and a lady's house only accepted with her letters written to the general was preserved drake's company then departed taking with them captured spaniards and negroes in addition, the English later took two more Negroes, this time from a Negro settlement at Nombre de Dios, according to the Spaniard Miguel Ruiz del Duan, who fought against Baskerville. It seems highly likely that these two groups of Negroes were indeed the Blackamoors. <laughs> Elizabeth points to in her first letter as she references Baskerville. The question then is not just why the Queen targeted Black subjects for deportation in 1596, but why she chose these particular black subjects? Why scapegoat as Blackamoors, 10 subjects designated as Negroes in contemporary accounts, who had just been brought by Thomas Baskerville from the Spanish West Indies to invoke that particular expedition, with which Kenneth Andrews has declared one of the worst conceived and worst conducted major enterprises of the entire sea war was not in and of itself particularly advantageous the venture did not hurt english standing in the caribbean but neither did it slow spain's advances there 
Mm. The head of the Spanish fleet, Don Bernardino del Gadillo del Avalanita, well, them Spain, well, them Spanish folks, in fact, used the events as evidence of English cowardice and his Spanish lies were troubling enough to prompt a bombastic rebuttal from Bakersville and one of his captains. The Negroes from the Baker Baker Baskerville campaign, however, came into England as prisoners of the ongoing Anglo-Spanish conflict. And it was that political position, I would argue, that made him especially useful and suspect to the Queen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's 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 deep. Tellingly, within accounts of the voyage, it is dividing the line of war more than any other make marker that defines encountered Negroes and defines them as Spanish allies. Admittedly, this alliance may have been uneasy, if not also coerced. At least for some Negroes who may have been runaways, Spanish accounts revealed that the Spanish were suspicious of freed Negroes who had come to serve the Spanish in this war. The Spanish surveyor Juan Batista Antonelli cautions that there is no trust nor confidence in any of these Negroes, and therefore we must take heed and beware of them, for they are our mortal enemies. And that's the thing, like, Africans weren't considered nobody enemies, which African is really just a name put on there by Rome, part of the Catholic church and stuff. Because Africa ain't even Africa. You got North Africa, West Africa, the rest of it ain't, don't consider themselves Africa, or they don't take on that title. So I don't get it. Like, why everybody keep trying to run this stuff down? No. In addition, both English and Spanish accounts raised the possibility that Negroes willingly left with Baskerville in order to escape Spanish rule. The Spanish governor writes that Drake took 100 Negroes and Negresses from the Pearl Station because they were diving for pearls, who for the most part joined him voluntarily. In a narrative not published until the 19th century, Thomas Maynard, who sailed with Drake, lists some slaves repairing to us voluntarily among their many prisoners, Spaniards, and Negroes. As well, the English admit relying on the intelligence of some Negroes during the venture and in one instance included a Negro along with three English men and a Greek among their own military casualties. So everybody know how to speak a certain language to each other. Yeah, they, they, they getting it in. Anywho, that was a good one. So we got the use of the term Negro and all that stuff and everything else. Yeah. So we know these people in Indian folks. They did a whole lot of breeding and everything. People was, it wasn't as crazy as it seemed. Yeah, that 1670 population of Virginia was said to be 40,000, including 2,000 black slaves. Evidence indicates that there could not have been that many Africans there, and also that there were a great many American slaves or servants. Thus, the total of blacks must have included a good many Africans. If you were not Christian, you were not considered white. Therefore, you would be considered black. That's just it. Even the pillars of the pale, if you weren't considered Christian or free or had land, you didn't own nothing, you were considered black or trash. And they got white trash, you know, all that stuff. Vagrants, poppers, people with no status, you just give them one. And let them run with it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Something to read. I want to pause it and read it. I'm not going to read it. I don't believe in the such thing as African ancestry. It's no such thing. You have to come from a nation. That's just the way the the world is set up. If you ain't got no nation you come from, I mean, hell, we all Americans, citizens. So people just have to work on that part. Talking about Paul Cuffey, half American, half African. What the hell is an African? Nobody knows. Anyway, we got this. Uh, that ain't the one I want. That's a good one, though. George Galfin. We got the patents. All this stuff. Now, this is how you get classified as white. George Galfin and Indian white relations in the Georgia backcountry during the American Revolution. All right. Just the first few pages. Break it down. And this dealing with Georgia, Creek Nations, Cherokee Nations. So this is break down old George Galvin. George Galvin from Ireland. Galvin's operation centered around his home at Silver Bluff, South Carolina, but he had other estates as well as a large collection of mistresses and racially mixed children scattered throughout the Georgia and Carolina backcountry. One of his concubines was a Creek princess who bore Galvin three mestizo children. He white. So it can go either way. Yeah. Actually, had, he had at least 10 kids. At least 10. And he's considered white. She's considered what? A Negro, Indian, colored, whatever you want to call her. So the kids got it made. Oh, I got. Oh, I wish I had more of the book. Because he made sure he remembered all of his kids' birthdays and he took care of them. He had kids all the way in Atlanta, Savannah. All over in South Carolina, whatever city he stepped in, he, yeah, he did his thing. Hell of a guy right there. They ain't got no description of him, though. I wish they did. And we got this. You know we are different nations and have different ways. They tell it all. I don't know where the white people at in this. Besides what they say is white. That's hard to believe when you are when you don't account for 10% of the population. In British America, there was no greater sense of otherness than between Europeans and Native Americans. Both Indians and Africans. God. Okay. So they just put four different kind of people in here you put europeans and native americans then you say both indians and africans represented the other to white colonists but the indians held one card denied to the slave africans autonomy wow as sovereign entities the indian nations and the european colonies often dealt as peers in trade war land deals and treaty negotiations Indians held power and used it as late as 1755. The English trader asserted that the prosperity of our colonies on the continent will stand or fall with our interests and in favor among them. Okay. What I'm talking about. The missionaries. How? Oh, gosh. Here we convey... Oh, here we canvass the many descriptions of Indians by white colonists and Europeans and sample the sparse but telling record of the Native American perspective on Europeans and their culture in pre-revolutionary 18th century British America. All come to us, of course, through the white man's eye, ear and pen, were it not for white missionaries, explorers and frontier negotiations. 
The go-betweens, known as woodsmen, we would have a much sparser record of the Indian response to colonists and their civilizing campaigns. In 1700 Pennsylvania, Francis Daniel Pastorius, the natives, the so-called savages. He was the founder of Germantown, the first German settlement in Pennsylvania. Okay, then. Mm. This is a picture of the supreme commander of the Uchi Indian Nation, whose name is Kipahagua. Kipahagua. Hmm. They're going to give him an English name, and you ain't even going to know who he is no more. The natives, the so-called savages, they are in general strong, agile, and supple people with blackish bodies. They went about naked at first and wore only a cloth about the loins. Now they are beginning to wear shirts. They have usually cold black hair, shaved the head, smeared the same with grease. Mama put that lotion on you. That's all that is. A little cocoa butter, you know. And allow a long lock to grow on the right side. They also besmear the children with grease and let them creep about in the heat of the sun so that they become the color of a nut. Although they were at first white enough by nature. Oh my gosh. Okay. So they're trying to say they out there roasting the children. They <laughs> Yeah, you know, your mommy's put grease on you in the morning before you go to school. She made sure your head don't be ash in there. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much straight that all. It's deep stuff though. They put stuff together. Oh, I wanna share this one here too. This one of uh Just like this one. So this one here is the English come to America. This is when Francis Drake then was running around robbing people, robbing the Spanish, hitting folks up, doing it big on the seas. The rise of nation states in Europe and the splintering of the Christian church during the Protestant Refor Reformation begun in 1517 led to political, religious, and economic competition for colonies in North and South America. In the 1500s, Catholic Spain built an extensive empire of its American colonies and grew rich with gold, silver, and precious gems. The Spanish used this bounty to pay for armies to fight their rivals in Europe. The desire for wealth and empire also drove English expor exploration to North America. Sound like them boys getting it in. That's just the way that go. Man, I'm going to skip on past that. Who that is? Sir Walter Riley? I don't know if he really looked like that. He looked weird. I don't know what the hell he got on. We don't wear that today. I think they will kind of win it in late 1800s all right so this is when they 1606 setting up colonies and stuff king james the first issued a new charter to a business venture known as the virginia company of london okay now the king granted the company all the territory between modern day cape cape fear north carolina and long island all right and here we go now what they supposed to do the Virginia Company investors expected to establish a colony that would extract North American riches, including gold, silver, and precious gems. That would be the quickest way to enjoy a return on their investment, but they were open to profit through other natural resources as well. Moreover, they wanted to find the Northwest Passage, a legendary waterway to the lucrative Asian trade. The company was an entrepreneurial enterprise designed to earn a profit and also a bold risky venture but no means was it success guaranteed now this is it 
the company's first group of 104 men and boys. They don't never bring women with them. I mean, you can't really bring them because you don't know what's going on. You just, you're on a business trip. You can't take your woman with you. You got to stay home if you got one. The way they leave and shit, I don't think they got nobody at home. Mm. The company's first group of 104 men and boys left London in December 1606 and landed in the Chesapeake Bay in April 1607. The company had appointed a governor governing council that selected a president, Captain Edward Maria Wingfield. Okay. May 14th, they chose its first settlement about 60 miles from the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay on the James River, named in honor of King James. All right. So they trying to set that up. Now, once they settled the site for their settlement, the English began exploring the area. On May 26, nearly 200 local Indians attacked them, wounding almost a dozen and killing two Englishmen. So now they're down to like about 80 people. As the Indians persisted in attacking at the settlement, the settlers began constructing a three-sided fort with bulwarks in each corner of the Mount Cannon. They planted crops, even though it was late in the planting season, but life in the colony remained difficult. In addition to disease and the lack of food, there was political infighting among the councilmen. By the time supply ships arrived from England in January 1608, two-thirds of the colonists were dead. What? Captain John Smith was a controversial figure among the first settlers. He arrived in Virginia in chains, having been accused of mutiny during the voyage from England. In the months after the settlement was established, he undoubtedly contributed to the political infighting on the council, but he also demonstrated his usefulness to the colony, leading expeditions to map the area and obtain food from local people through a combination, combination of force and trade. In December 1607, while exploring the Chesapeake, the Chickahominy River area, Smith was captured by the brother of the Powhatan leader. He was taken to the northern shore of what is today called the York River to meet Chief Powhatan. Powhatan was a great ruler, powerful ruler who controlled most of the tribes in the Chesapeake region. John Smith described him as tall, well-proportioned man, his head somewhat gray. Oh, they took out the part when they say he was tall and dark and swarthy and black. He could have been a blackamoor. You could call him a Negro, Indian, all that. Well, they skipped that part. His age near 60 of a very able and hard body to endure any labor. Smith was fed and questioned during his stay with Powhatan. He later claimed that Powhatan attempted to execute him, but the chief's young daughter, Pocahontas, saved him. Today, some historians believe Smith misunderstood his ordeal and that, in fact, he underwent an adoption ceremony in which he was ritually killed and resurrected by Pocahontas. <laughs> it seems that Powhatan had decided Smith and the English settlers were worthy allies. Perhaps he wanted to control trade with Europeans. Perhaps he wanted access to metal tools and weapons. We cannot be certain of his motives, but we can be sure the great chief was no novice at diplomacy. Yep. That's how he hit him right there. You see him smoking that peace pipe. And the boy sitting there looking crazy. Oh, yeah, he got initiated into the group just that easy to find something like that out. Anywho. Same thing with George Washington. George Washington lived in the Indian world, but his biographies have erased Native people. This is from Long Reads. Stuff is on the internet. It's easy to find. You know, just type in stuff you want to know, and it's going to tell you what you want to know. What to say? On Monday afternoon, February 4, 1793, President George Washington sat down to dinner at his official home on Market Street in Philadelphia. Market Street. Hmm. Washington dinners were often elaborate affairs with numerous guests, livered, servants and plenty of food and wine on this occasion secretary of state thomas jefferson secretary of war 
Henry Knox, Attorney General Edmund Randolph, Governor of the Northwest Territory, Arthur St. Clair, and a gentleman of the President's family dined with him because they were hosting an official delegation. Six men, six Indian men, two Indian women, and two interpreters representing the Kakaskia, Peoria, Bianca Shah, Potawatomi, and Muscatine nations had traveled more than 800 miles from the Wabash in Illinois country to see the president. Before dining, they made speeches and presented Washington with a calumet pipe of peace and screams of wampum. Wampum. Get it, boy, that pipe. Everybody know. You get that pipe and you hit it. Right before dinner. Oh, boy, you're going to tear something up. Mm. That one tobacco. That one no tobacco there. I know. Mm -mm. Yeah. He had to sit down and uh, hit that pipe with him. Oh, we got... That's another instance on here where they had to hit it again, too. Yeah. Just one week later, Monday, February 11th, Washington dinner guests included several chiefs from the Six Nations. I bet they probably bought some weed, too. Everybody got weed. They just get enjoy watching the high as hell. He's just like, all right, yep, yeah, I'm the president. He looking like Joe Biden up there, like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna make it work. What you say I gotta do again? Some good ass turkey. What is this? It's turkey. It's corn. All right, I got you. Washington dinner guests included several chiefs from the Six Nations, the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois. Yeah, take that big word off. A Christian Mohican named Hendrick Oppermutt. So he really white then. He's still a Mohican, but he classified as white because he's a Christian. And that A.K. Haraquin, Atia To Gwen, the son of an Abenaki mother and an African American father. Oh my gosh. Like that word wasn't even in use until the 1980s. And 200 years into the future, they smoking something good. Who had been adopted by Mohawks but now lived in one out of country and who was usually called Colonel Lewis Cook. After Washington approved his commission for services during the revolution, before dinner, the president thanked his Indian guests for their diplomatic efforts in carrying messages to tribes in the West. When it was 1770-something, the West wasn't considered past the Mississippi. Well, it just got past Mississippi after they took the uh, French territory. Indians halted when yellow fever broke out in Philadelphia in the summer of 1793. 5,000 people died and 20,000 fled the city, including, for a time, Washington, Jefferson, Knox, and Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, who survived a bout of the fever. A Chickasaw delegation on his way to see the president turned back on hearing of the epidemic in the fall. But the visits resumed the next year. On Saturday afternoon, June 14, 1794, Washington welcomed a delegation of 13 Cherokee chiefs to his Market Street home in Philadelphia. They were in the city to conduct treaty negotiations and the members of Washington's cabinet Jefferson, Hamilton, Knox, and Colonel Timothy Pickering were also present. In accordance with Native American diplomatic protocol, everyone present smoked and passed around the long stem pipe in ritual preparation for good talks and in a sacred commitment to speak truth and honor pledges made. The president delivered a speech that had been written in advance. Yeah. That's that good stuff. Wow. They weren't even smoking no resin. No, they had some of that exotic. Several of the chief, the Cherokee chiefs spoke. Everyone ate and drank 
plentifully of cake and wine, and the Chiefs left seemingly well pleased. Four weeks later, Washington met with a delegation of Chickasaws he had invited to Philadelphia. He delivered a short speech expressing his love for the Chickasaws and his gratitude for their assistance as scouts on American campaigns against the tribes north of the Ohio and referred them to Henry Knox for other business. As usual, he puffed on the pipe, ate, and drank with them. <laughs> oh, Joe Washington was a weed head. Because you ain't going to smoke no tobacco and want to eat. Not that easy. That's after the tobacco after you eat, but that weed before you eat, though. I got you. I got you, President. Mm-mm-mm. Smoking. Yeah, man. That's crazy. Anywho, that's just one thing. There's a lot of stuff, man, that goes on in history, man. You just have to catch up to it and see what be going on. They'll run that slick on you real quick. They're like this, runaway slaves and the making of Georgia. And you know, the Irish got shipped over here. They got shipped straight to Barbados and all of the islands and stuff. And like I just showed, they were shipping Indian folks all of Europe, too. So... If they shipped into Europe, yeah, Europe, well, Europe shipped them to Spain. But they, I think they kept some of them, though. I think they kept a good bit of them folks. You see the Chickamauga flag, which is supposed to be a racist Confederate flag, but they had colored troops and colored folks is literally considered Indians. You know, the Indians never really got put on the trail of tears, like people say. Partially. It's just so much craziness, man. We looking at stuff in terms of skin color. No. No, no, no. Skin color ain't got nothing to do with it. A lot of folks. A lot of folks had some stuff going on. And we don't know nothing about. Slaves in the making of Georgia. Man, look here. Where it said that? And it's from 2005, so you know they done changed everything. You know what I'm saying? Who wrote this book? By Anthony F. Moffat. You already know they wrote they wrote whatever they wanted to write in it. The Carolina invasion. So Carolina literally brought the slaves into Georgia. They got new Negroes, African runaways of revolutionary Georgia. Religious upheaval among slaves. What are having religious upheaval for? Like I said, the Africans was already Christianized before they came. The only people that wasn't Christians or partial Christians was the people of the land. And Africans was expensive, I guess, because they could read and write, probably. But, you know, they tell us a whole different story, but I don't, I don't know, man. It just don't seem right to me. And just like we looked it up before, they already had a whole bunch of, whole bunch of Africans coming over here. That was baptized. Living that life. Rome been took over all that part of Africa and everything. He got them Barbadians in Carolina. Look at that. African passages, low country adaptations, Barbadians in Carolina. Mm-hmm. This stuff written is so recent of time that it's just rough man trying to even read it you have to go back and like read the stuff that they were saying matter of fact i'm gonna hit you with this one right here because i don't know why my stuff always pop up and go the south carolina slave code is how it go the negro law of south carolina 
This is another way they done classified folks. And this was by who? John Belt Belton O'Neill. They just really summarized everything. Because they modeled their, their uh, what they call it, their laws after Barbados. So here we go. Section one declares all Negroes and Indians free Negro free Indians in amity with the government. Negroes, mulattoes, and mestizos who are now free accepted. We ain't including them to be slaves. I declare all Negroes and Indians to be slaves. So basically, they're saying, "Hey, you got to prove it. The offspring to follow the condition of the mother, and that such slaves are chattel property." All right. Under the provision, it has been uniformly held that color is prima facie. Prima facie just means the order. It, it just means the here and now. Or on site, matter of fact, on site. So if I see you, you look like a slave, I'm going to try you. You know what I'm saying? You better pull them papers out. That would have mean that the party bearing the color of the negro mulatto or mestizo is a slave but the same prima facie result does not follow from the indian color see this is this is just this is just what do they call it it's that tongue work it's that tongue lab man they throwing stuff at you check this out section three indians and the descendants of indians are regarded as free indians in amity with the government now this is 1740 so 1740 georgia ain't nothing but four years created and it wasn't even a whole state it was probably like a, not even a quarter of the state it was really just along the river so everything else was considered indian country so what are we trying to do here now that's just like me leaving from augusta and going to bird county i'll be in indian country <laughs> Every Negro, Indian, mulatto, and mestizo is a slave unless the contrary can be made to appear. Yet in the same, it is immediately thereafter provided that Indians in amity with this government accept it, in which the burden of proof shall lie on the defendant that is on the person claiming the Indian plaintiff to be slave, to be a slave. This latter clause of the proviso is now regarded as furnishing the rule. The race of Slave Indians or of Indians not in amity to this government is extinct and there and hence the previous part of the proviso has no application. Four, the term Negro is confined to slave Africans, the ancient Berbers and their descendants. It does not embrace the free inhabitants of Africa, such as the Egyptians, Moors, or the Negro Asiatics, such as Lascars. Mulatto is the issue of the white and Negro. When a mulatto ceases and a party bearing some slight taint of the African blood ranks as white is a question for the solution of a jury. See, that's that's all right. OK, no idea. Now, the mulatto, when the mulatto ceases and a party bearing some slight taint of the African blood ranks as white is a question for the solution of a jury whenever the african taint is so far removed that upon inspection a party may be fairly pronounced to be white and such has been his or her previous reception into society and enjoyment of the privileges usually enjoyed by white people the jury may rate and regard the party as white i ain't gonna read all this but i'm gonna put my what they say, my one eighth cent in there, one fourth, all that out the room stuff. Man, look, the majority of people on the planet are colored, it don't matter how you look at it. If we fighting against each other and somebody that don't look like us is around, hey man. You don't look like you from around here. Come here, let me get you. But yes, there was a such thing as everybody was a slave. It was so hard to even figure it out. Because you had free 
Negroes, Indians, all that. It's a whole bunch of stuff. A lot of stuff is switched up now. A lot of it is. So we don't really know what's going on. So what we gonna do? We gotta get it together. Anywho. I don't know what else I got on here. Them Barbadians. Oh yeah, that's what I was gonna do. My Barbadians in Carolina. So when they talk about all of these people they done brought into the colony, we have to look at who exactly were they bringing into the colony so we can get a clear understanding. Now, many black and white settlers only briefly spent time in Barbados before arriving in Carolina, still their experiences. Now, they already said black and white settlers. Oh, you know, but it was, but it's real. And people still think some so-called white people been out here bashing us over the head and telling us what we can and can't do. Right, the only way that happens is if you if you and if you go to school like you in elementary school or something, or you just in school, period. You know what I'm saying? Your mama told you, your dad and like, hey, just do what the teacher tell you to do. Or you in jail. And you're like, hey, man, just do what you got to do to get up out of here. Any other time than that, man. Or you work for somebody. But, doubt. Ain't no way you're going to tell me somebody was really, really getting down on us. Beating us down, running us chained up and all that no come on man you can check the population now they tell you it's 300 but they said like 300 million so-called white people in america that's a status man most of them people ain't even gonna claim white they'll take it because they get i think they get what good credit when they come here they come here a lot of them come as refugees just like mexicans was classified as white in the 1950s so like white is just a status it doesn't account for what the real population is, but we gonna, we gonna ride with it. That's just that's just that's just what it is. I hit them with this because it's a lot. Various white Barbadians who had been small to medium-sized landholders on the island immigrated to Carolina in the first decades of settlement. Many families who became prominent planters and slaveholders in Charleston, including the Middleton, I'm uncle lad name, Drayton and Gibbs family have Barbadian origins. So that means these folks are part American. These Anglo-Barbadian settlers brought colonial experience, the parish system. And the parish system comes from the poor people that was in Europe that Queen Elizabeth was trying to figure out what to do with the same ones they dumped over here and in Australia and New Zealand, wherever else they can find people. That's where the Paris system comes from. It comes from England. Wow. The Anglican church and plantation slavery to Carolina. In the 17th century, Barbados and the West Indies were also Carolina's chief source of enslaved labor. One third to one half of Carolina's enslaved laborers at this time migrated from the English West Indies, particularly Barbados, rather than directly from Africa. In exchange for enslaved Africans, sugar and other commodities, Carolina settlers shipped lumber, pipe staves, pitch, tar, resin, beef, pork, corn, peas, and enslaved American Indians to Barbados and other West Indian colonies such as Jamaica. This trade connected, connection launched Carolina's early economy before the growth of rice agriculture and continued into the Revolutionary War, severed U.S. ties with other English colonies. These early trade connections were so significant that historian Peter Wood described Carolina as a colony of a colony of Barbados. So we know them. Oh, nope, we ain't gonna say it. We know that black on black crime going strong. Many black and white settlers all only briefly spent time 
in Barbados before arriving in Carolina. Still, their experiences on this West Indian colony influenced Carolina's commotion, commercial priorities and legal systems. It gets deeper. It gets deeper. In 1691, Carolina traders established a slave code, just read that, modeled almost verbatim after laws passed by the Barbadian Assembly between 1661 and 1688. Like I said, African people was not fighting back. Unless they, you know what I'm saying, they were more expensive than, than European slaves, though. So, I mean, it ain't even no point for them to fight. Yeah, they cool. So what Africans are they bringing? What enslaved Africans? Oh, you mean the Berbers? Oh, okay. Yeah, we're going to find out who the Berbers are. They were the most... Oh, this code serves to legally define enslaved Africans as chattel property in Carolina. They were the most draconian statutes for enforcing slavery in the North American colonies. Through ongoing trade relationships with the Indies, white and black Carolinians also shared information and ideas, including news about slave rebellions that occurred on various Caribbean islands throughout the 18th century. For whites in Carolina, this further encouraged fears about maintaining the safety of whites in a black majority colony. And led to increasingly strict and violently enforced laws for Africans and African Americans in Carolina and beyond for enslaved Africans in Carolina. News of rebellions and black resistance inspired hope for freedom as well as concerns about white retaliations. I don't want to throw this in there. So at the same time, Carolina's active American Indian slave trade within the colony and to the English West Indies which Barbadian settlers strongly encouraged, created tensions between European settlers and low country American Indians. These tensions nearly destroyed the colony during the Yamasi War. I love Yamasi. I used to ride through there a lot. It's a beautiful place. I mean, you know, it's beautiful. When a confederation of American Indian groups attacked Carolina settlers in retaliation, for American Indian slavery and other trade and land encroachment grievances. By 1719, Carolina had officially split into North Carolina, North and South Carolina, though the first official governor of North Carolina was appointed decades earlier, and settlers asked the English crown to take direct control of the colonies. South Carolina settlers believed that the Lord's proprietors could not provide effective management or security to protect them against outside attacks from American Indians and European rivals or from African American and or from African and American Indian slave rebellions within the colony. I wonder if they made them smoke too. Because they sure got Joel Washington. Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamza, all of them had to hit the dope. Boy, you better hit this blunt, but it's this ain't no after school special. You better hit this nigga. Hit it. You already know. It's a whole lot of game being played with people. Too many games being played. Which is wild. I got this one more. I'm gonna go on here and leave it alone. Oh, that ain't it. Oh, that one was a nice one, Bartels. Oh, Black Catholics. Yes. So we done got to the term. Well, African American is new, so that really ain't even nothing. That just put AA in the title. Black Catholicism, Religion and Slavery in Antebellum, Louisiana. 2005 and it's from lsu digitals which i love i love lsu yeah louisiana is it by lori renee pastor mm -hmm. it's a good book the social and economic exchange among slaves Free People of Color and the Catholic Church in Southeast Louisiana. I'm telling you, man. 
Telling you. Hit the abstract. The practice of Catholicism extended across racial boundaries in colonial Louisiana and interracial worship continued to characterize the religious experience of Catholics throughout the antebellum period. French and Spanish missionaries baptized native settlers and slaves and the Catholic Church required Catholic planters to baptize and Catholicize their slaves. Most slaveholders outside New Orleans, however, were lax in the religious education of slaves. Most worked holidays and did not always correspond to religious holidays. Holidays and holidays sound the same. And the number of slave baptisms and confirmations on Catholic plantations often depended on the willingness of the local priests or the slaves themselves to attend the parish church. Mm -hmm. Despite these limitations, the slave persons in the river parishes of Louisiana integrated Catholic rituals into their expressions of spirituality. Slaves use of herbs, medicinal practices, voodoo, ghost lore, and folk stories combine their experiences as enslaved persons and their contact with Catholic teachings to inform their worldwide views and the Catholic Christianity of all parishioners in Southeast Louisiana. It's a lot. For free women of color, the Catholic Church offered particular opportunities to extend their religious, social, and economic standings. In the river parishes outside New Orleans, free women of color demonstrated their piety and their financial resources by engaging in economic exchanges with local churches. In New Orleans proper, a group of free women of color formed the Sisters of the Holy Family, the first order solely for women of African-American descent in the city. Well, I tell you, African mean African mean Catholic. It ain't got nothing to do with where you from, man. Cut it out. What's Africa? Leo Africanus, whatever they call them, from the BC or whatever time it was, the AD that colonized North Africa and brought it under Catholicism. It's just that easy. That's where that African come from. People talking about African American. But y'all don't know Catholics been running the US for the longest. That's just it. All the presidents been cool with Catholics. And Joe Washington, his what stepkids or whatever, the ones who married into all the other families, they were Catholics. Thomas Jefferson, they're yeah, rocking with the cats because they didn't care about your religion. They just like, hey, let's just get along. Folks run that game on you tell you African American. That mean what that mean? Catholic American? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Mm -mm -mm. So they formed the sisterhood, the sisters of the holy family. The first order solely for women of African American descent in the city in order to aid ill and needy blacks. Although the Catholic Church had neither unqualified success nor absolute failure among African American parishioners during the 18th and 19th centuries. Wow. The experience of free women of color in Louisiana proved that some blacks found religious as well as social and economic identity in the Catholic Church. Ultimately, the Catholic Church provided some degree of spiritual agency for those who incorporated and changed Catholic practices to fit into their lives. In colonial Louisiana, the Roman Catholic religion fashioned the lives of natives and settlers. Who are those settlers? Are those those free Negroes. Didn't Benjamin Franklin say all of Africa is black or tawny? Asia, chiefly tawny. But you wear you, well, that bar for bar with him. The French, the Spanish, the Swedes, the Russians, Italians are all of what we call a swarthy complexion. Only a few people in England make up the principal body of white people. 
Which hell, we don't even know if they were black or white. We don't even know. We don't know what skin color they was. Everywhere is multiracial, but uh, that dark skin dominated though. We know Ireland was, you know, dark skin. Scotland, all them people that were getting shipped over here. A lot of them was in indentured servitude, slavery. It's a lot, man. It's a lot. This ain't for no school books, man. It's too much truth to be told, because if they tell the truth, then all that white superiority stuff just, you just stomp it. You just open up your track hand and just fill it up with it. You what? Superior to who? How? That's what surprised me about stuff. Like, literally, you can dribble a basketball and become a wealthy person. You can play a sport and be good. I mean, hell, get an education, all that stuff. Because when I look up Joe Washington people and, like, just people in general, man, that people call black, African-American, all that, a lot of them come from, you know, that's where the term silver spoon in your mouth come from. Like, man, our history is, is world history. American history is world history. Like, and yes, so-called white people are included in it. You know what I'm saying? Hey, man. Hey. It's been like this a long time, man. Men like women. And here, some people are killed to get them. Some people, you know, people plotting schemes. Some people got swag. Some people don't. Some people use the swag or the sword. What it called? Shoot. Some dude can just, you know what I'm saying, spit that game. What up? Yeah, let me get you. Some of them out there kidnapping and snatching them up. Hey, it is what it is. Everybody was in slavery. I'm going to get this little part and I'm going to be off of it. In colonial Louisiana, the Roman Catholic religion fashioned the lives of natives and settlers, free and enslaved alike, from Indian and African slaves to Jesuit priests to free women of color in New Orleans. Individuals often explain who they were or expanded their roles within their families and societies in religious terms. Same way around here. If they know you, they're going to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I fuck with you. Yeah, but I know who you is. But you need a job. But you need something. You need anything. But I got you. Yeah, but I know your mama, your daddy. Yeah, but I used to holler at your auntie. Yeah, I got you. It's a society, man. Yeah. 18th century French missionaries baptized indiscriminate of race and sanctioned interracial Catholic unions, hoping to build a Catholic colony of settlers and natives. While some French leaders argued against French Indian marriages and even against the extension of sacramental rights to black slaves, many authorized interracial marriages as biologically solidifying French claims to the area and universal access to the sacraments as ensuring the peaceful acculturation of Native Americans and black slaves. For the colonists in Louisiana, religion also provided a layer of identity that shaped their personal lives and their involvement in a wider culturally and racially heterogeneous society, particularly in the rural parishes of southeast Louisiana. Roman Catholicism provided a venue for religious as well as social and economic opportunities for enslaved and free African Americans. Hey, this is from 2005. Never mind that African American gibberish they putting up there. I ain't gonna read no more. You know, I did say few Protestants or, Jew, or Jews inhabited early Louisiana, but after 1803, the influx of English and Americans introduced large numbers of Protestants into Louisiana who formed communities within their own particular beliefs. Hmm. Slaves owned by Catholics during the colonial period, while nominally Catholic, according to the Code Noir and the Siete Partidas, had little say in the matter. Many adopted the Catholic faith to fit native African religious beliefs. What? So that's it right there. Many, hold on, hold on, hold on. Many adopted the Catholic faith to fit native African religious beliefs. I don't know. 
Uh, it is too much, man. I mean, that there, that is crazy. Yeah, ain't much more to say on that. I'm good. Yeah, I'll take it easy.